Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm happy this worked right away because sometimes it's so awkward getting on online and then you're waiting for the guests and it takes like, I don't know, a couple of minutes. But this worked right away. So thank you for being online. Of course, um, I thank just you want... for asking me. Yeah, of course. Um, I just want to give a quick introduction to everyone who's watching or listening later on Spotify. My name's Tony Why Not, and um, I have this podcast, Safe Spaces Series, where I talk about mental health and nightlife with guests, friends, experts. And our guest today is Josh Donaldson, mental health advocate, founder of uh, When the Music Stops, which is a nonprofit community that supports mental health, um, suicide prevention through music, connection, and love. You've been working in music for 20 plus years. I feel like you've seen it all and you went through hell and back and your journey is super inspiring. And that's why I feel super honored to have you on today. But before we get into that, I wanted to ask you, how are you doing right now? Uh, I love that. Thank you for that question. Uh, a little anxious, but n I'm not in a bad way. Just uh, I, I'm, I've been ramping up and I'm working on like seven projects right now full time. And so I'm not the best at time management. So, and if you're not great at time management, then things can kind of overlap and bleed into each other and deadlines can merge and times and meetings and you know what I mean? So, yeah. But you don't feel overwhelmed. You're keeping it, keeping it chill. I'm excited about the future. Okay. This is what I like to hear. I mean, yeah, no, I feel you because I'm German and I'm super on time and it's uh, yeah, very important to me and moving to America. I've definitely realized that Americans, some people are not so much on time all the time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> is that an American thing? Okay. I feel like it's a non-German thing, uh, you know? So um, yeah, like being overly punctual and you have some friends who are, you know, they're always late and I'm like, you're wasting my time, but you know, it happens, but. How long ago um, did you move, move to America? Eight Eight years ago so i've been in new york for eight years and your, your english is great yeah i mean yeah you, i mean but like you don't even you sound more like a new yorker than you do german <laughs> um i feel like sometimes my accent is really thick and when people know that i'm german you can definitely hear it yeah but thank you i take that as a compliment um so getting right into it um i mean yeah we can obviously talk about where you come from, what you did, what you did in the music industry, but I kind of want to know what are the biggest lessons you've learned from working in the music industry in terms of mental health? And if you could say something to your younger self, what would you say right now? Okay, well, those are two different questions. So you're, uh, you're gonna have to remind me on the second okay. one. Um, the first one, um, wow, I mean, so the music industry is a uh, it's funny because there you're engaging with you know so many people um on every level but it, it's a very lonely business um a, a lot of uh managers and artists um a lot of musicians you know spend time alone um carl cox dj carl cox famously said um a long time ago in an interview that DJing was the loneliest job in the world because one second you have 20,000 people screaming your name and going off to your music and you have this amazing immaculate connection. And then um, two hours later, you're in a hotel room, you don't know where, there's no room service, there's no Wi-Fi, and everyone you know in the world is asleep somewhere and you're just by yourself and you have this rush of adrenaline after the show and you're just laying there staring at the ceiling. You know, and I know hundreds of DJs that can relate to that. Um, Here's you know, another so, one. <laughs> yeah. And, that, and that's why uh, partying kind of, it comes with it, but it also numbs the loneliness. Um, if you're drinking or you're like hanging out with strangers or whatever that is, it, it helps mask the, um, you know, the, this, I don't want to say disparity, but you know, the, the, the fact that you're, you know, alone after a show. Now I'm not, feeling sorry for anyone and i don't want that to be the case i'm not no one's looking for pity you know but i think it's more that from an outsider looking in 
the music industry is all about community and connection, but there's a lot of loneliness inside. There's a, a lot of, some of the best creation and some of the best music comes out of depression. Obviously, you know, famously um, Nirvana, you know, uh, Kurt Cobain, you know, uh, Jim Morrison, you know, so as we know in history, a lot of pain and suffering makes the best creation and cre best music. So now here we are in 2023 and um, we get to talk about mental health and we get to talk about mental health in the music industry. And so it's more of a conversation now than it, I, I believe it ever has been. Right. That's saying that, that people are lonely or mental health in general. Yeah. No, um, I, I think mental health in general, I, I've been, a, especially the pandemic really shined a light on everything because there were so many musicians globally that freaked out. Um, there were so many DJs, so many producers, so many people I know that couldn't tour anymore, couldn't get on that next flight, um, you know, didn't know what to do combined with the idea of is the world ending? Are we all going to die? Things like that. Everyone kind of freaked out. And so a lot of mental health conversations came out of that. So mm. there's still a lot of stigma on suicide and suicide prevention. But um, I think that mental health is more in a daily conversation. It comes up more maybe just because, because of, uh, of my uh, background, but um, it comes up more often I see now than it ever did in, in the older days. Yeah, I totally agree. And I mean, to be honest, this podcast also was birthed in the pandemic because I, as a touring DJ, I mean, I, I had a total existential crisis as well. And I thought, you know, like my world is going to end, my career is going to end and all of that. So my biggest challenges have also been in the pandemic. And I see, I mean, I was talking to so many people during the pandemic and their mental health. I'm like, no one is talking about this. Like no one's talking about how shitty they feel or how lonely or they're ashamed because they feel anxious and depressed. And yeah, I mean, that's why I'm doing this. I'm raising awareness through this. So you're right. I mean, now it's being talked more than ever, but I still think it's not talked about enough. And, you know, it's funny because no, it's actually incredible that I'm talking to you because I talk more with women publicly about this than men. Yeah. Like there's not many men that talk about this publicly. And also um, you're, you work in the background. So a lot of my guests are always DJs and other DJs because I'm a DJ and I talk to other artists, but not like not many people look at the side of the agent or the promoter or someone like you who's been working on like the backside of the artists and not you know like working yeah behind the scenes and how these people are struggling too so i really appreciate that you're sharing your knowledge um with all of that it's it's my, my pleasure and no I, i'm happy to be here i'm lucky to be alive and i'm very blessed that I've been able to learn a lot and to grow a lot over the last few years and to help as many people as I can and serve as much as I can. So if my story can inspire someone else or allow, or at the very least, let them know that they're not the only one that feels that same way, then, you know, that's why I'm here. Exactly. I mean, I obviously know your story, but for everyone who's watching and doesn't know your story, do you want to tell us a little bit what happened to you? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Let's do that. Did you want me to answer your second question about my younger self? Also, I have more. I mean, I have all these questions, but yes. Um, okay, so my younger self, I would, uh, I would tell my younger self, buckle in. Um, it's going to be a ride, but you're going to get through the other side. I don't think my younger self would listen to me, though. <laughs> um, I like that. Yeah, so, uh, okay, how far back do you want me to start? Uh, whatever you're comfortable with. Oh, I'm com comfortable with everything. So okay, I mean, how did you get into music? And yeah, how, let's do it. You know, what let's did do you, it. What did you do? I uh, so I'm um, um, I'm in my, my early 40s. Um, so I grew up in, in Seattle. Um, that's where I'm at right now. Um, I actually moved back after 22 years. Um, I, uh, I'm in Seattle, which is famously a, a, a music capital. It was a big music city in the late 80s and in the 90s. Um, in the time period that I was in middle school and high school, there was some of the biggest bands in the world were really popular. Alice in Chains, Mud Honey, Nirvana, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam. That was all in the era that I was, uh, you know, coming to age with myself and, and going to uh, being in high school and things like that. 
And in that same time period, um, in a parallel world, uh, was techno, house music, and warehouse parties. So um, we had a, a, a lot of influence in the, there was a big rave scene in Seattle, and there was some incredible DJs. Um, and so I was going to raves, I was going to concerts, and then I went to a high school that was really popular with, uh, you know, early rap music. And so I was just, music was my everything. Um, I started going to raves and I wanted to do a documentary on the rave scene. Um, there was a documentary that came out in the 90s called Hoop Dreams. It won the Academy Award, I think, for best documentary at some point in the, in the 90s. And my understanding, if I remember correctly, it's been a while was that they filmed these high school basketball kids for like six or seven years. Um, and that blew my mind, the idea that somebody had the patience to film something not knowing what's going to happen. And so I had this idea while I was in high school that I wanted to film uh, the rave scene and the evolution of the rave scene. So I, I found the biggest dj from my hometown um his name was donald glad um and he was traveling all over the world traveling all over the country i i was half his age and uh no no, no i shouldn't say half his age I, we're, I was a little younger um and uh and we um i would go to shows and he was the superstar he was the headliner and i asked him you know can i can i do a documentary on you and he kind of laughed and said yeah sure let's do it and we just had this bond you know and we were you know he was 10 years older than me and stuff like that and uh we just connected on music and i was so curious and i had so many questions and so everything and he kind of took me under his wing as like a like an assistant like an apprentice and so i found myself straight out of high school um carrying his records you know back this is back when djs only had vinyl so he liked to bring a lot of music with him so there wasn't usb so uh the way that i got into it is i would carry four record bags i'd have That's one heavy. On, i had oh one on one on my back that was a backpack and then we had two flight cases that were metal cases that protected the vinyl so you could check them on the plane and so they were really heavy they're about 40 50 pounds each um and so that was kind of my role for the first couple of years. And so I got to go to the best, biggest raves in, in America in, the, in like 97, 98, 99. I mean, this is how I met you know, Pasqual and Insomniac and uh, Milo and Audiotistic and Disco Donnie. Like I met all these guys when I was 17, 18 That's years old. Epic. Um, and so I got really to be really close friends with them. We're still all, I still know them all. And um, I, uh, I was the, the kid that was I was the scrappy kid from Seattle uh, that dressed like I was in uh, in an NWA music video that was going to the biggest raves and I had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder so I was I had a lot of ego and I was I like to bark orders at people and stuff when I was really young and um, I I just believed in the artists and the music and my my goal at that point wasn't to make money or anything like that my goal was to protect the artist was if i can carry the records and i can worry about the flights and the hotel rooms then he can focus on the music now i wasn't the agent there was a big agent um at the time am only but um and then i i just kept showing up and then i i, I had this crazy idea i was like let me be your manager he laughed mm -hmm. i was like you're in high, mm -hmm. you're in high school and i just kept showing up and kept showing up and kept showing up. And two years later, I was, I was in the contract. Um, I was the manager. And by the time I was 21 years old, I had been to, I don't know, 15, 20 countries with him. Wow. And this was in the 90s. This is before the EDM boom and all that. So we were going to raves in Colombia. We were going to raves in Russia, like all this stuff. And so, you know, but I was still me. I was just, ex just, I wanted more. We were going to Hong Kong. We were, you know, and there was a rave scene all over the world. Everyone wanted that unity, that sense of community. Um, so I was addicted to it. Um, but my role was to be that of the support, to be in the background. To, there's all these photos of when I was younger and I'm in the DJ booth because I'm behind the DJ grabbing the drinks, carrying the records, grabbing the vinyl, you know, doing what we got to do, taking pictures for fans, whatever it was, that was my role. And so I didn't go to college because I just fell in love with the music industry. 
And uh, I had an ear for music. I, I would have been an unbelievable, I believe I would have been a great DJ. I have an incredible ear. Um, but I took on that role of supporting the artist rather than being the artist. Um, and that was really important to me because, you know, if everyone is the artist, then who's going to support the artist? Exactly. And so in the, uh, in the early two thousands, I ended up leaving Seattle for Los Angeles, bigger, brighter, you know, and, um, I started, uh, helping cause I had flown all over the place. This is before social media, but, you know, really early internet. Um, I, I knew all the other DJs, you know, so I could get them on the phone. I could call their house. I could, you know, whatever it was. So I started doing talent buying. So I started buying and booking shows also by going to every major rave, every major festival, you know, nationally and internationally, I knew which DJs killed it and which ones didn't. I immediately knew, you know, like I'll never forget the first time I heard Monica Cruz play a techno set in Colombia in like 2001, oh, wow. you know what wow. I mean? And I was like, oh man, who is this? You know, and it's like you, you, yeah. you, back then everyone only had a limited selection of music, you know, so, and they would put white labels on the records, you know, I can digress into talking about this kind of stuff <laughs> um, until I'm blue in the face. But so I became a really, I was like super excited uh, I had a lot of energy. Um, they used to call me the Don King of the rave scene. Don King was a, was a notorious boxing promoter in the 90s. Um, be, I, I didn't want to be a, the biggest promoter. Uh, I let Pasquale and Donnie and those guys be that person. Like I, I was, I admired them. But what I did was I knew how to find the best DJs from everywhere and slot them mm -hmm. in. And so mm -hmm. in, in 2003, uh, a man by the name of Neil Moffat, who was the owner and founder of uh, God's Kitchen and Global Gathering Festivals out of Europe. Um, he owned a bunch of uh, big nightclubs in um, Northern England um, and in, I think in Birmingham. Um, he, uh, he famously came to me and said, uh, I want you to move to Las Vegas. And I was like, what? And, and he goes, I want you to do a residency with Donald Glaude. We called it Thank Glaude, It's Friday. And then I want you to do marketing and promotions and all this stuff. So I went to Las Vegas, um, 2003. And then every, everyone has their different version of the story. But uh, I was definitely a piece of bringing EDM to Las Vegas. And I was one of four people that that did the biggest contracts in the world and started paying DJs millions of dollars. You know, we started with like a 1500, 2000, 5000, 10,000, but um I some of the biggest DJ contracts in history. That was that was me and a couple of my peers. Um and uh I always wanted to push the boundary, so I would bring artists for their first time um i got to be on the team that brought drake for his first time ever to uh, las vegas um i did i booked the first ever major laser show in las vegas i was the first person in las vegas to book tommy trash and benny benassi and you know what i mean it was it was really cool um and so that really solidified that um fast forward i ended up kind of getting burned out i i I opened up a Hakkasan uh, nightclub with a bunch of people. I was doing residencies. I was helping book all the DJs there with a, a gentleman by the name of James Allgate, who is my mentor. Um, I was flying around. I was managing artists. I was managing hip hop artists, uh, hip hop DJs. Um, and then um, one of the things that everyone likes to talk about is, uh, you know, I became really close friends with uh, Tiesto and um, he was doing the biggest world uh, DJ World Tour in history at the time. It was the 2010 Kaleidoscope World Tour. It was about 156 countries. It was like semi trucks and stadiums, and it was like every country in the world almost. And uh, I did about half those countries with him. He, he brought me on as the tour manager. Um, and so I just I left Las Vegas for a year, moved to Ibiza. Um, I that was, was after his trans era. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was <laughs> yeah. when he was working with Tegan and Sarah and Sneaky yeah. Sound System. He was way ahead of his curve. That is one of the best albums ever uh, in, in dance music. And people didn't start listening to it in, until, you know, again, until like years later. It was so ahead of the curve. And that he knew that sound was going to come into fashion. And he was right. It was like 
a fusing uh, like uh, indie sounds and underground sounds with like, you know, um, and, but that same summer is when Swedish House Mafia, David Guetta, and then Avicii toured with yes. us and were, like opened for us. Um, so all the so, progressive house guys. Yeah, we, we all, we all, and so we all knew each other. We all flew around. Um, I was in D Dusseldorf at the last ever Love Parade. That's where um, my mom's from. Really? No, that was Duisburg. No, I, I was there. There was like 10 documentaries about it. We could talk about it. Uh, what about the tunnel where yeah, people died? Yeah, I was there. Oh, uh, yeah. It was, no, that was Duisburg. That wasn't Dusseldorf. Yeah, you Google it. I, I was there. I, I, there was like 10 documentaries. I've watched them all. I, I, was, I was there. I have all the photos. I have the video. I was there when it happened. You know, but we can talk about that offline. Um, it's totally fine, yeah. yeah trust, <laughs> trust me, I'm traumatized. It was burning, burning into my head. I'm sure. I mean, that, that whole story was terrible. Yeah, there's still ongoing negotiations about whose fault it was to this day. So Yeah, the police, they shut down the tunnel and everything. There's so many documentaries about it on... on uh, YouTube. I'm sure our listeners are like, what are you guys talking about? Um, <laughs> it was a music festival, one of the best and biggest music festivals in the world. And uh, there was an incident that happened actually during the set, during our set, um, while we were on stage, um, where 22 kids were trampled to death. But um, anyway, so I went back to Las Vegas, kept going. And then I ended up starting a consulting company with a friend of mine doing consulting in uh, England, Ireland, uh, New Orleans, Seattle, New York, um, all over the place. Um, I became a partner in one of the most successful nightclubs in the United States. Um, we opened up two of them. <clears throat> we, uh, I was a partner in some art galleries with him as well. Started going to Burning Man, all this stuff. But I just I got a little bit older and I realized I didn't have a wife. I didn't have any kids um my family was djs and um i had been drinking for 25 years and i just started to feel really empty it started to feel kind of all meaningless um because i had been doing it since you know 97 and so by 2017 i felt pretty empty inside i had flown on a thousand private jets and been to 200 villas and been on a million vacations yeah and you've and seen seen it all in the music i mean being talent by a tour manager manager i mean it's really like all sort like all sides of the story so sounds yeah. like you've been through a lot and you've seen it like really like everything in the music industry we were in uh, egypt during the arab spring when they overthrew the government yeah holy shit of, yeah and uh, i was there with tiesto in um in the Red Square in uh, in Moscow. the Kremlin, yeah, in Moscow, we did one of the biggest concerts ever since like Michael Jackson. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so there's there's some really beautiful, unbelievable moments of of, and then I've I've had some incredible mentors. There was a time period where I got to work with uh, Amy Thompson, who was one of the, uh, she was one of the managers, main managers behind Sweet House Mafia for many many years. I think multiple times uh, and she was managing Bob Moses and everything. So I got to work with her. I got to work with James Allgate. I got to work with Neil Moffat. I got to, you know, and then I was always had a friendship with, with, uh, you know, Pasquale and Donnie and, and, and Milo and, and uh, a number of people. So um, I was just always learning and growing, but I just, for me personally, I just felt empty. Like, you know, I, um, going to, I never got it. I never was into going to after hours. And then I started going to after hours and, I just, it, I just digressed. And um, I guess to make a long story a little longer, uh, January, January 2019, um, I, was, uh, I was at a music festival in Costa Rica. I had a psychotic breakdown, uh, got on the next flight without my bags or luggage, flew to Miami. Um, and then um, I slipped my wrist. I, uh, I, I was sober at the time. No drugs or alcohol were in my system. Um, and I tried to kill myself in a, in a trigger warning, I guess, a little late for that. We should do a trigger warning on this. Um, um, I attempted to take my life. And um, I want to be careful with my words right now. Um, it was a, about a two-hour process of what I was going through. Um, and a friend of mine in the music industry felt like something was wrong couldn't get a hold of me didn't know what was happening because nobody knew what i had done ended up getting a hold of the police in new york the police in new york got a hold of the police in miami they had to track my location and again there was that that was all just to do a wellness check um they didn't know what i had done and um there was a 
a large number of uh, police cars and uh, ambulances and fire department things that they were they were pretty speechless. They constantly kept asking me for a couple hours, like, how are you alive? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, apparently within two days, they had picked up somebody that had done a lot less than me and was not, not here anymore. And so uh, one of the ambulance drivers, he, uh, he stabilized me and locked the door. They officially took custody of me. And uh, he said, I don't know what you're going through, but uh, you're not allowed to leave. Um, every, every five or 10 years, we see a soul that isn't allowed to go anywhere. And he goes, I hope you get your head out of your butt and, and find your purpose in life because whatever you're doing, isn't your purpose. Something else is, you know, and that really stuck with me at the time, at the time I didn't know what he was talking about. I was just crying. Um, but it burned into my subconscious and I've never forgotten those words. And, um, I ended up going to a treatment center in Florida where I'm not from. And the music industry came together. A lot of friends and family came together, did a big fundraiser for me, and they put the money to, uh, together for me to go to a really nice, expensive treatment center. Um, not like Malibu or anything like that, but like a place that is a male only. And um, I, um, uh, I did a 90-day stint in there. Five weeks in, my roommate overdosed and died. And so I was just like freaking out. And then uh, I graduated. They said, you can go home. My family had packed up my home, so I didn't know where to go. And so I said, what if I stay? And they said, it's going to be expensive. And uh, I stayed for a year. And um, at six months sober, they told me, you need to go help others. And I didn't understand what that meant. I said, what do you mean? And so I had to learn what it meant to be of service. And so I spent 17 months um, during the pandemic because there was only a short window of the pandemic in Florida, um, 17 months volunteering in treatment centers and detoxes, helping people that had either just overdosed, um, just lost their kids, just lost their jobs, um, just got a DUI or tried to kill themselves. And for the first few months, I ran my mouth. I just would talk about traveling the world with celebrities and DJs and that didn't help anybody. And so, um, in September 2019, a miracle happened um, right around my 40th birthday. I stopped talking and I started listening to people. And that's when my whole life changed. And that's when I found uh, mental health and suicide prevention because the, a big percentage of us, and hopefully this can help someone that's listening, a big percentage of, a, of us that are out there are going through life feeling unheard. Un, like not feeling felt, not feeling mm. understood, not feeling heard by our significant others, by our siblings, by our families, by our children, by our friends, by our coworkers, by our employers. And I know that because I've worked with thousands of people in 17 months and that was the common denominator for 80% of them was just no wow. one ca- cared. And so every once in a while, Um, if I just listened to somebody and then I didn't give them advice afterwards, magic happened. Their soul Mm -hmm. felt heard for the first time sometimes in years. Now this isn't, again, I don't take credit for this. I'm just somebody who survived a suicide attempt and who was stopped talking for the first time in his life. Mm -hmm. And, and I got lucky to be that vessel that got to be somebody that just sat there and listened to somebody else's story and that is real suicide prevention. Wow. wow, that is so profound. I mean, yeah, if you just give someone the space to say something without need, having the need to answer or give advice, I feel like some people have never said how they feel in their whole lives. And if someone just asks them like simply like, hey, how are you? And they talk. Yeah, that's really powerful. And I mean, oh my God, your story is just... Wow. I mean, someone should make a movie out of your life. I've been, I mean, (laughs) I've been told movie and book uh, like forever. I've been told that, but um, we'll see. But uh, I just, it's not about me. Right. And that's why on when music stops, there's videos with my face, but um, I try not to make it where I'm talking always about me. I know that my story can help people, but I want, it to be ambiguous. I want it to be about 
everyone else, not just about me. It's not about what I've been through. It's about that we all are going through something. Right. How, how can I take my pain and turn it into passion by being quiet and listening to somebody? And I know that there is um, some talking that needs to happen. I, I do these beautiful panels called Nightlife and the Struggle of Balance, which is kind of what we're talking about today. And um, the Groove Crews, actually, shout out to Jason and the Wet Foundation. Love, love, love them. Uh, shout out to DJ Stellar for connecting us and believing in me. Um, I'm kind of the mental health director on the Groove Cruises. I've done like two, three of them with them. And we do all these mental health panels and stuff. And these are famous party cruises where everyone's going bonkers. Um, but we do this thing where we do breakout sessions. And one of the things that I do, and I've done this multiple times in different cities and on different cruises, um, we take a panel of like five or six DJs or producers that are playing on the ship or at music festivals. I've done this a few other places. And I am the uh, moderator and we talk about mindfulness we talk about what works for them what doesn't mm. what are their struggles you know what and so you could be a kid in the crowd and you get to hear your favorite dj open up about maybe he has anxiety mm -hmm. you know there's a there's a story i won't get too into but one of the biggest djs in the world uh not, not tiesto but one of the biggest djs in the world old school guy from the 90s um he uh <clears throat> I was the biggest fan ever. And I went to him one time to take a photo when I was young and he kind of was rude to me. And so later on when I became this, you know, Vegas hotshot talent buyer guy, I booked him just to question him about 15 years, <laughs> you know, 10, 10, 15 years It's like years an later. ego move. Yeah. 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 Big time. <laughs> and I, I, I took him to dinner. It was just him and I, no manager, no nothing. And I told him oh the story, God. like I was the biggest, your biggest fan. And I went to get a photo and you were rude to me. And he goes, I have social anxiety. He goes, I have panic attacks before I DJ every single time. Mm. And I was like, Oh my God. He goes, yeah. He goes, I don't, that's why. And this DJ notoriously doesn't, it would turn down gigs forever. We always thought he was because he was rude and cocky. Mm. He goes, I have a fear of DJing, mm. and, but he was one of the best in the world. And I found quietly so many DJs have struggled with anxiety, social anxiety, panic attacks, disassociation disorder, so yes. many things. And you don't know it because yeah, they're just think, human. Yeah, exactly. And like so many DJs are also, I mean, for example, being on the spectrum, I mean, there's several colleagues that I know that are autistic and like no one really knows. Yeah. And they think they're just weird people or whatever. But yeah, it's really crazy when you think that your your biggest idol also has issues. But that's exactly why we're doing this. But I want to go back to something you said. And like you said, you don't want to make it about yourself. But I mean... I'm providing the space here for you to talk because I want to know something about you. And also, you know, I don't want to like, there's all these identities that we run around with. And I mean, I'm like, I have long COVID and I'm very vocal about it, but I don't want to be identified as like the girl who has long COVID or the DJ who has long COVID or the female DJ or all these, you know, identities that I carry around with me. And for you, I mean, you're the founder of when the music stops, but that's also just part of your life right that's not all of your life so i'm really happy to just talk about all your life and your story so feel free to just talk yeah <laughs> but um no of course i mean when you're working and you're doing your panel discussions and stuff you're obviously listening and when you're mentoring you're listening to um, your clients or whoever you're talking to and i mean that's really really profound to listen but so i mean do you feel like I mean, it's kind of a hard question, but you feel like the suicide of ten is also, in a way, something good that happened to oh, you because it turned your life around? I absolutely. Okay. So I wouldn't use the word good, but right. I think that the best analogy is like a phoenix rising from the ashes. Um, you, in recovery, we have to hit... Okay, so I don't want to get too philosophical philosophical but i love philosophy uh there's a famous philosopher who specialized in mythological studies his name is joseph campbell and he uh came up with this concept of the hero's journey each of us are our our own hero in our journeys and if you look at the hero's journey there's an archetype and the hero has to have a challenge 
he has to be questioned he has to t and it could be it, it could be it, it's not gender specific it, it's it's just any journey i'm I, a hero i'm just using he as an example yeah. um the the hero turns away from you know advice and doesn't listen and there's a great challenge and the hero something bad happens and then the hero has to rise again and then take their story and help others what's funny is that in the 70s george lucas was a student of this philosophy and that's what star wars mm -hmm. came from oh. Luke skywalker is completely based on the hero's journey um but so when i found out about the hero's journey later on i'm like oh my goodness i'm living this <laughs> life right now so it's just in my pain pain also was very traumatic for my friends and family um, because I didn't leave a note. There wasn't any warning signs. Um, that's one of the reasons why I want to stop, start when the music stops because we really, everyone, a lot of people still use the uh, old school traditional way of look for the signs. Are they, you know what I mean? Are they isolating? Which I get and I respect. You know, are they you know, are they listening to Marilyn Manson? Are they list are their fingernails painted black? Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, look for, you know, is your friend despondent? But just last year, one of the star athletes, uh, a woman from Stanford, honor roll, super popular, everything in the peak of her stuff was going through something, um, took her life. So in 2023, we now know that you can't just look for the signs. You have to listen to people. Now, right now, in order to help more people, I think that the evolution of my story and managing artists and tour managing artists and all of that stuff is now, um, about a year ago, I started life coaching. Um, I do life coaching for creatives, um, for, I've, well, for anyone, but I specialize in creatives, artists, DJs, producers that, you know, either are going through blockages or struggles or have goals they want to achieve and want to find clarity, or there's D DJs and producers that maybe music isn't their purpose and they want to find their purpose. I help with all of that. And I've been working on that for a year and just to get better at it i'm in the middle of the jay shetty school right now um it's about four to six months and all that and i just learned in one of my classes one of the most profound things um jay said jay shetty said in one of our classes he said um <laughs> he said your no matter your expertise your advice is not is most of the time not as good as you think it mm -hmm. is and, mm -hmm. and that hit, hit me in the face, like, oh my God, like, wait, what? And I wrote that down and then I rewound, I was like, thought about it. And I was like, wait a second. And I realized I'm talking to inspire people, but I don't have the best knowledge or the best advice. I'm just somebody sharing my journey and my truth. And each one of our stories is valid and each one of our truths is valid. So if I'm coming to teach everyone on how they need to do things a certain way, yeah, that's not more, how it works. <laughs> more often than not, my advice and what I'm teaching isn't going to be applicable. It's not going to be the best. But if I can help validate, if I can help empower, if I can help remind someone of who they are or just simply listen, then, then I'm actually doing something. Exactly. No, I've, I think that's so profound that um, the suicide, he's, like you said, suicide prevention really starts with listening or just raising awareness or you telling your story. And it's not when someone's about to do it or, you know, or is in a depression or an anxiety, anxious state of mind, like you said. So I really, I really like that. And what you said before about the hero's journey, you know, well, when you said you would tell your younger self buckle up, but you probably wouldn't follow that advice i mean you have to go through something horrible sometimes to come out on the mm -hmm. other side i mean that's my personal experience as well it wasn't a suicide attempt but it was also a hard time like you said every story is super valid um yeah i wouldn't be sitting here today talking about mental health if i didn't have that struggle so you're absolutely right and um yeah no i really Really, I really like what you're doing with uh, when the music stops. So maybe we talk a little bit about what you're doing. And I saw that you do 
stuff at events where you provide spaces for people to come to if they're struggling and you also do yeah panel discussions and all that so it's not just when the music stops it's also when it's happening right yes absolutely <laughs> that's really funny but yes um so for me i um came up with the idea of when the music stops about three months after my attempt on my life and um i was sitting in treatment and uh, i was like you know at first it was it was I was thinking about the DJs, like what happens when a famous DJ from the 90s can't get a gig anymore? You know what I mean? Like what happens when the music stops? And then mm -hmm. I took it a, a, a step further. I started thinking about the fans because it can't just be about the artists. So I, so I was like, well, wait a minute. What about the kids that are going to festivals every single weekend right now? What happens when they stop? What happens mm -hmm. when they go to every festival for two years three years five years and then they finally stop where what what where does that leave us because in the 60s there was the summer of love which lasted you know 1967 there was a little spillover 1966 1968 you know um woodstock happened but it was a short time period we've been raving since the 90s you know not everyone but like this is like not stopped Dance music festivals are everywhere, every weekend, all over the world. And there's a big chunk of people, you know, that don't just go once a year to Tomorrowland or EDC that are going to every festival or every warehouse party every weekend. And at a certain point, that is a little bit of escapism from your own reality. Mm. And once you ever have to stop, like, let's say you get a job or you get a wife or you, you have children or something like that. What happens then? What are you prepared for when music stops? You know, or the pandemic. It, I mean, for real. Yes, <laughs> uh, ab absolutely. And um, you know, for me now, it has grown and it's more ambiguous. So now, when somebody says to me, "What does when the music stops mean?" Obviously, everything I just described is what was on my heart at the time, but that's changed. Now, when you say to me, what does when the music stops mean? I say to you, what does it mean to you? And some people will say, well, I feel like it means like if I lose my job, you know, and I'm not getting paychecks anymore. And I said, yes, that's it. So it's whatever your interpretation is, is exactly what it's supposed to be. And for mm -hmm. me, I, I looked in the mirror and I was wondering why did, how come none of the other suicide prevention nonprofits reach me? I don't blame them, but I was thinking, are their programs designed for people that go to festivals all the time and go to nightclubs and go out and have social active life, you know, and some of them are, but some of them aren't. And so I was like, well, maybe there's enough, a room for an alternative, you know? And so mm -hmm. I was like, okay, great. This needs to be a nonprofit. This needs to be something that is from somebody that was raised in our scene since high school um, up into his 40s and is still in it. And then how do we how do we help kids? And so we've done in per so online, I had the goal of, of reaching 50,000 followers. Um, I, I did that within a year, I started with one and I begged people I remember my first 2000 followers was so hard. I used mm. to ask people, Hey, do you have a roommate? Can you have your roommate follow? <laughs> Like it was so hard and then I hit 50 K. Um, but you know, I, I had somebody not too long ago ask me like, what'd you pay for that? And I'm like, I'm trying to save lives. I'm not, I'm, I'm not paying for, no, I'm not paying for it, you know, but, but so I stopped doing anything because it got too overwhelming at a certain point after the pandemic, I had like 20 volunteers, but right now there's like one or two people that, that help me out whenever they can. And I can get anywhere from 10 messages in a day to 200 messages in a day. And I used to answer every single one. Mm. So for four years, I paused my life and was only focused on saving lives. And I used to push people to uh, therapists and uh, 988 and hotlines and things like that. But I found that when you push people to something else, rather than listening to them, it often doesn't feel good for them. Mm. I, I've had a hundreds of people tell me 
when I come to you to listen and you send me somewhere else, it just makes me feel, you know, dismissed. Yeah. And so I, I got better at holding space with people, but I stopped holding space for myself. And so that's the online version. Okay. Then I was like, well, we have to have the in-person version. So we started taking a group of volunteers and having booths at music festivals, all kinds of music festivals all over. I've had a lot of big promoters reach out to me, but then they don't, follow up sometimes they're like mm -hmm. oh yeah we really want you there and you know but they don't have a budget and they don't know what to do and you know so it's okay for us it's really fun you come to us we give away mental health journals there if you have a when the music stops mental health journal you're giving it you received it in person most likely from me um, i've never sold them online i've made thousands of them and only give them away um, it's really special because people will message me and might be like, Oh, I filled it up. How do I get another one? You know, Aww. it's really, it's really beautiful. But so, and then I started incorporating games. So you come to us and I find, I want to find ways to do uh, connection. Um, there's some friends of ours that created these, um, mindfulness cards. So it's like affirmation cards. Um, and you pull it over and it says, you know, I'm right where I'm supposed to be or things, the universe is listening to me. And so you could pick that, or we have a wheel that you, you spin and it, you could win a hug. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you want a hug, but, but it's Make also it playful. Other that yeah, that's great. People love, love, love it. And then I have a big banner of artists that have passed away and that's, that is what draws people in. People see that and they're like, wow. oh my God. That causes a lot of tears, but also so much connection because mm -hmm. people can remember everyone from, you know, it doesn't have to be suicide. Everyone from uh, Jimi Hendrix and Kurt Cobain all the way to, I mean, we've lost so many DJs in the dance music community. A a Avicii, um, you know, Mac Miller, it could be overdose, it could be whatever that is. And so I've gotten promoted mission from a lot of people to make these and we only do it as an honor we don't sell any posters or anything like that we only we have make these banners to remember them and to honor them and there are inspirations and what i found is people in when i do the suicide prevention at music festivals and at events 70 percent of the time people that come up to me have lost someone mm. so so yeah. most of the people that come up to me lost a brother, a sister, a daughter, a, a niece, a friend, a cousin, you know, and they are just, they are looking to connect. They on, want to connect. Online, on Instagram or on Facebook, it's, I'm going to take my life. I need help. Wow. You know what I mean? It's because there's the anonymity behind the wall. So you the could screen, be, yeah. you could be, you know, privately, but. And then when I'm doing the events, whenever I'm like, if I go to the bathroom or I'm walking around a festival, constantly people will privately come up to me and be like, you know, the, the fam most famous one that people do constantly, I, I, will, I will admit this publicly for the first time, is I'm struggling, thank you. But I would never take my life. I would never hurt myself. You know, it's like, okay, that's all right. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's a, yeah. But people love to tell you they would never do that, you know, right. but they also have had those thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so what I like to do is just validate that. It's okay to have those thoughts, you know? And one of the things I'm known for saying, and not every academic or uh, person, um, educator believes in this, but I think it's okay to have those thoughts. It's just not okay to plan it. You know, it's like not OK to like act on it. But so many of us, I was just talking to an artist this week that was like had a rough week last week and was thinking, what if I just ended it all? But right. they didn't want to. They weren't going to act on it, but they had that thought. And they came yeah. to me a little worried like, hey, I had this I this yeah. thought. Is that, should I be concerned? And I'm like, is that a regular thought? And they go, no. And I said, you're fine. Just what triggered it? They're like, well, I was overwhelmed and I felt disconnected and I was having anxiety. Okay, cool. Let's work on that. Like, right. how do we, how do we unpack that? Now I'm not a therapist. I'm not a clinician. And this is the difference between a therapist and a life coach is two things. A therapist or a psychologist looks at what happened in your past and says, okay, that is causing this diagnoses you and says, let's treat it or cure it. 
Mm -hmm. A life coach mm -hmm. says, what are your goals and how do we get there? And what are your blockages and how do we get over them? I like that. I like that. And I also, I mean, I, first of all, the whole festival in person thing, going to see music should be a connecting thing. Obviously for a lot of people, it's escapism and, you know, like trying to escape their reality. But if you make it a playful experience, especially at music festivals and like, like you said, you're making games around, you know, like opening up the conversation around mental health. That's so powerful. And I've never heard of any, like anyone doing this besides at Burning Man, there's a camp where you can go to when you're tripping really hard and you're freaking Zen out. Zendome. It, exactly. Have you <laughs> been like to I've, the burn? Yeah, many times. I was I've just been, there. I've been, I've been seven times. Yeah, so was I, seven times. Oh, funny. Yeah, did you escape the rain? <laughs> no, I stayed and buckled yeah. in. I went yeah, of to course. The, I, I went to the Agave Lounge and hung out, and they turned into, into a refugee camp. They were taking people that had – because a lot of tents got – filled with water and mud we could talk about this offline but yeah 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 but yeah no it was yeah, we were there I had, I had a great time yeah <laughs> but then also i mean in switzerland there's a thing i think that it exists in the u.s too we can test your drugs at raves and stuff like legally so dance that safe. so that's different so yeah dance safe is amazing so that is called harm reduction um yeah i respect that i so what i do not do is i don't do drug freakouts and i don't right. test your drugs Exactly. Um, so but, I was going to say, like, I've never heard of anything that you're doing anywhere else besides those things are kind of related to it, but it's really not and that's, the same. But that's why it confuses people. So pe I love that you just said that because people are like, well, we have dance safe. Well, that's something different. You know, what we're talking about is anxiety and, um, and you know, maybe not feeling heard or not finding connection you know the people that i worry about some of the most are the ones that have uh like a big following on social media and go to festivals and they're known at that festival and they have a hundred friends at the festival and then on monday they're alone mm -hmm. and they're and they're struggling with mental health or their identity or with their you know um what they're going through with their you know, or they're being picked on or bullied or abused, you know? And so the festival or the rave provides that escape, but then they're hitting reality a lot harder. And I've heard a lot of, a lot of people, you know, open up about that. Yeah. And I mean, like you said, when the music stops, like uh, with the pandemic, so many of my colleagues, they don't know where to go. Like all their whole community is just poof, like not existent anymore because nightlife doesn't exist anymore. And Yeah, that's that that's a real problem and I love the title so much when the music stops. But yeah, also maybe maybe you do a separate community of while the music is going on. No, yeah, I mean no, it's a silly no, name. It, no, no, it's it's okay, but uh well, yeah, no. I uh it doesn't the music doesn't have to stop. <laughs> um but it, it but it it's it definitely gets your attention, you know, and There is, there's a couple of, uh, I can't remember their name right now. I have eight, I have a lot of emails from them, but there's an organization out of Europe, I think out of Holland, and they work on mental health for DJs. Um, I think there's a couple of them now that they reach out to me. And then there's Music Cares, which is owned by the Grammys, and they do a lot of good work. And then uh, there's an organization called To Write Love on Her Arms, um mm. but they're notoriously a little bit more in the alternative rock scene mm -hmm. skater uh surfer scene but so they're that's more their community um i, I mean i don't want to pitch and hold them to that but that's what they're known, right. known for and then um trevor project um is big in the lgbtq uh, uh tia community um and um so there's a few You that are out there, it's not just us. Backline, backline is good for the industry. Um, uh, backline cares, I think it is. Um, they help with like roadies and I mean like everybody, but like sound engineers, roadies, stage managers. Um, so there's a few of us out there. For me, I I got burned out. I went all in. I mean, I've. When the Music Stops has taken me um, to do in-person work 
uh, in Haiti, in Tulum, in Cabo, in Austin, in Nashville, in San Diego, in San Francisco, in Oakland, in Seattle, in New York, in West Palm Beach. That's busy. Yeah. Yeah, because I always wanted it to be a national organization. Right. And, but I ran out of money. Um, I raised a lot of money. I poured everything I had into it. And so this year, what I've, I've, I decided to set a boundary. I, I paused as much in-person stuff as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, art with me famously is a, is a music festival in Tulum and music and, and Miami. Art yeah. and Miami. And I have a booth there each time. Um, I'm, I didn't answer their email right now because I'm overwhelmed. I, I, I don't have the energy to go do it in. Um, and I never got to the point where we could afford to send teams of volunteers and things like that. So there was an unlimited demand, but so right now I'm working on my mental health and my physical health. Um, but I'm, I, I jumped on during uh, mental health awareness month in May reached you know, 80,000 people with a couple of posts in like two weeks and had a thousand messages. And then suicide prevention month, um, I jumped, which is September. I jumped in early and reached a lot of people. And, but I'm trying to have my own boundaries with my project because I obsess over it and I, I want to help everyone. And then I stopped caring about myself. Exactly. That's what happens. That's happened so much really like with people that want to help then they give, give, give. And then at one point you just can't give anymore. So this whole thing was birthed out of your mental health crisis. So of course, if you're not working well, then there's no point of doing it. So you obviously need to look after yourself. So what are some tools that you do to keep yourself grounded? Or uh, yeah, absolutely. You have? So uh, for me, uh, Josh, not when the music stops when the music stops is an agnostic organization that's public benefit that is not affiliated with any political group religion spirituality anything but me josh as a human i'm spiritual and so i pray um i pray i meditate um i love i've studied so many different meditations whether it's i've studied tm i've studied ziva i've studied japanese zen buddhism meditation i've uh mantra meditations, body scan meditations. Um, I love, love, love breath work. Um, there is a human that I just adore so much. Um, her name is Lihi and her last initial is B, Lihi B. And uh, she's on Instagram and she does these classes in Venice Beach, California in Los Angeles. I, I'm fl my birthday is tomorrow. I'm flying. There oh my God. On, I'm flying there on Monday to go to her classes. That's my birthday gift to myself. <laughs> um, her, her, I, I try to, I, whenever I'm in LA, I go to her classes. I try, I mean, and they're transcendent. I've taken artists there that have just cried. Uh, I mean, I've taken friends that have had, you know, I mean, it's just unbelievable. I feel like it's like, 20 psychotherapy sessions with one good breath work class. You're wow. Moving, you're moving stuck energy. I love sound healing stuff. Um, a lot of people love yoga. Uh, I'll drop in on a yoga class every now and then. I'm not a yogi or anything like that. Um, I love sunsets. I love going to watch the sunset and just sitting with myself. Um, nature, nature, nature. I, I can't say it enough. We, we think that, you know, we take nature for granted. And we're surrounded by nature. Uh, if you're in the city, you can get out of the city and nature is healing. Nature heals mm. our soul. Nature heals uh, our, our mind, our body, our spirit, our nervous system. Um, take your shoes and socks off for 15 minutes. You know, it sounds silly. It sounds hippie, but the earth is really powerful. You know it's what I mean? Grounding. So exactly. It, yeah. All of, I do a combination of all of those things. Uh, yeah, to, and you found your grounded. little toolkit, right? Like you found the yeah. things that work for you. Obviously, some things work for some people and other things for others. But I'm glad you found your combination through your whole journey of stuff that works out for you. And I agree, nature is so important. And yeah, honestly, I want to get more into breath work because I want to get more into what, like, I, I'm aware of emotions, but how do you get 
rid like how do you release them properly and then how much trauma is stored in our body and all that i mean that's a there's whole a, different conversation there's a book but, yeah there's a book uh by a, a dutch a, a doctor a PhD, oh. dutch, dutch author the body yeah. keeps the score yeah yeah, yeah. i have yeah. that it's right here <laughs> did, but did you read it it's very scientific so i didn't get so far it's okay it's, though it's okay though but it's really, it's really good and then but good. yes bro, breath work helps unlock some of that stuff I recommend classes in person, but the studio that I go to in Venice, Open, they have an unbelievable app called Open. Um, and on there, they have pre-recorded uh, breathwork classes with the teacher that I'm talking about, Leahy B. And they also, um, she does live ones. They do live classes, live. So you can do a live breathwork class with a coach on the app as well wow. unbelievable wow. stuff i love what they're doing there's breathwork which is an app as well uh, nick is one of the founders and um there's a lot of good stuff out there but open everything that open is doing i i love so much i love, love that no that's great and um yeah i mean how do people find find you i mean that's a it's a lot of stuff that we talked about obviously a lot of information we can't post all the resources just because it was so much to cover but how do people find you how can people reach out to you if there's someone out there watching listening who's really struggling right now what can they do to get in touch with the organization or with you yeah of course um well so my email is <clears throat> josh at when the music stops dot org um but also is when I have the capacity, I answer every message on the When the Music Stops Instagram page. Um, I run the page. I, I've given it to volunteers from time to time, but it's it's a lot to, of emotion to handle. Um, and I, uh, my personal Instagram is Joshua C Donaldson, and I, um, you know, I do life coaching um, as well. I, uh, I I help people find their purpose and find clarity in life. Um, and then, um, yeah, you could, you could DM me on my personal Instagram. You could DM me at when the music stops, you could follow me on either one. You could email me. Um, I'm pretty accessible and I respond, you know, probably more often than I should. And mm. for anybody that's hurting right now, I mean, you know, be gentle on yourself. It's, it's part of the journey. Um, just know that, you know, things are going to be okay. And whatever you're going through, it, it will pass and mm -hmm. you're not alone. Um, so many of us out there are there for you and understand what you're going through. And um, I hope that there's somebody in your life who can listen without giving mm -hmm. advice. And if there's somebody out there who wants to help somebody else, I cannot not reiterate enough to listen and then not give advice unless asked mm -hmm. because more often than not, the people that want to talk to us are not asking us how we relate to it or what our thoughts are or our opinion or our advice. That's our own projection that we're doing. Yes. And 90% of the time, that's what we do. Again, that's so good. You know, sometimes on Instagram, I have a day, like an open day where I just post in a story like, Hey, I'm, if anyone's like going through it right now, DM me strangers and or friends are welcome. Like I'm here to listen and like, I've had the most amazing conversations with people. And I feel like, yeah, even if it's a complete stranger, it helps so much just to listen or help like try, you know, find help with them or something. And like you said before, when you have conversations with people and you just direct them to somewhere else, it, you know, sounds a bit dismissive or something, but you know, you can like try to look for help together and you know even get family or friends involved and stuff so definitely listening is and listening is a lot of fun too you learn so much there's so much to learn yeah, yeah i i used to think that i was a good listener when i was younger because i could hold six or seven conversations at once and i could uh tell you what you said but i didn't know until later in life how to listen with my heart mm. you know listen, listen with your heart not with your ears that's why you're doing all these grounding exercises <laughs> to drop into the body and out of the mind. 
but yeah, no, this is good. I loved having you on today. Thank you so no, much. I'm really happy it's, this happened. And it's my it's my honor. It's my pleasure. I, I'm I enjoy the conversation. You had great questions. Um, I love all the work that you're doing. I love that we've been able to connect, and I love that you stayed on me about this. I used to do a lot more of these kind of things, and I got busy, and so I'm really happy that you were uh, you you know were you consistent with following up. Yeah, I mean. I mean, you know, I used to, the first couple of episodes were just with friends or like people I know in the industry, but now I started reaching out to more experts or organizations and there's so much help that like out, not help out there, but like there's so many things like your organization or you out there that are willing to help people and, and there's amazing work out there. So um, yeah, keep on looking and I'm, yeah, this is super exciting. I love doing this and it's a lot of fun. So thank you very, very much. No, this is my honor and thank you for the work that you're doing. And, uh, we are definitely going to have to talk about the burn. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, were you on robot heart on Sunday night? Cause I was playing. <laughs> Were you? Uh, yeah. sun, no, Sunday night was still in the in the. In the no, rain. Sunday night was the first night. It was the very first night, oh, like when I oh, arrived. I, I like, got there on Monday. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah got, you missed I got, it. I, no, I, I, I got there on uh, on Monday, but um, I I was uh, at nine forty five and eight, so I wasn't far from Robot Hearts Camp. Nice. Um, I was there with a uh, arts. I did art car support. Um, we oh, cool. had, we had, I camped with two art cars, uh, a old school art car called the Bump Bed. Okay, nice. The bunk bed. I haven't heard of it, but yeah, nice. I've been going to the burn since 2014, but I haven't been since before the pandemic. And I, I don't know, but that's a whole different conversation of how much you associate with things anymore and blah, blah. But yeah, I love we'll talk that you, about it I love, that you, I love that you just said that because um, on Thursday night at the burn, right before the rain, I ended up, I went to the Diplo Sunset set uh with the at the pineapple submarine and i ran into um oh no oh, uh cara delavine the the model mm -hmm. from london yeah. and we talked about mental health and we talked about suicide it was like a couple minute conversation wow, yeah. she was yeah. so sweet and so amazing and it was like ran into her and then i went back and journaled about it and everyone was getting ready to go out and i had this sense of completion mm -hmm. and i realized in that moment after seven burns i think i'm done and I, because i feel like i've experienced everything that i want to out there and there's so many things i want to do in the world and it takes so much time and energy and money and everything like that um so we'll see what happens people always try to bring me in for different reasons but um there's a, so many different things i want to do in, in the world so yeah exactly yeah i have same thoughts exactly seven burns and maybe you the seven good years are been good yeah. years, but maybe it's time to yeah stop the music. But who knows? Anyway. <laughs> oh no! Why don't we just move the music? You know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it, no, no, I mean stop the music no, there I, for us. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, but, but um. Anyways, uh, this is getting put, super. Put, put, put out the fire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, put out the fire and don't light it again. <laughs> just keep it, keep it keep it off um but yeah thank you everyone who's been watching and listening later on spotify and all that um yeah i hope you're having a great day you're in seattle right yeah I'm, i uh, i'm in seattle tomorrow is my birthday and then I, I fly to los angeles on saturday super early and i'm there for a week for meetings nice have the best birthday happy birthday to you you know in german <laughs> it's bad luck if i say happy birthday before the birthday so i'm a little yeah uh, Takes, yeah, don't, yeah little... don't don't curse me <laughs> yeah, i'm not cursing you i'm americanized now enough so <laughs> okay great anyways have a good day and i'll talk to you soon we'll keep the conversation flowing bye, bye.